This episode is brought to you by Progressive, where drivers who save by switching save nearly $750 on average. Quote now at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, September 22nd, 1999, The West Wing debuted on NBC, the show about the White House staff and the president and all the behind the scenes things that happen in a presidential administration. It was a fiction show, but The West Wing was wildly influential on a whole generation's view of what politics is and what politics should be, not to mention hugely influential as a TV show. So let's talk about the West Wing in that political context, given what our show is. Who better to join us than our fellow Radiotopian Rishikesh Hirway, host of many shows, including Song Exploder and, of course, the West Wing Weekly, the king of TV rewatch shows, which he hosted for many years, along with uh, Josh Molina, who starred in the series. Rishi, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Um, Do you know on that night that the West Wing premiered what it was up against? No. What was it up against? Nothing that interesting, but like Big Brother uh, and a show called Oh, Grow Up uh, on ABC, which got canceled like a week later. And uh, Roswell on the WB. I'm taking Star Trek Voyager was on UPN. So there you go. It was um, it found its little niche. I definitely didn't watch it the day that it aired. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's see if either of our other guests (laughs) did here. As always, Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. And the answer is yes, I did. You did. The day, wow, you were there yeah. day one. Hey there. And the answer is no, <laughs> I did not. No. <laughs> well, I will tell you why I was there on day one. Um, first of all, this is tailor made for everything that I love in a, sort of like a, a cultural product. It has politics, it has kind of the pomp and circumstance of the White House, but also. I was an enormous fan of the movie American Mm. President. I watched that thing over and over and over and over and over again. And now it was getting a reboot as a TV series. Yeah. I I was very much in. I did love the American President. I love a lot of Aaron Sorkin shows. So, you know, I'm surprised I haven't watched this show. But now maybe, I don't know, I need to do a binge. Can I binge it? Is it on Netflix? I don't know. (laughs) Yes, you can binge it. And there's a companion podcast for you to listen yes. to. Yes. <laughs> Rich, do you want to trace that like initial moment? I mean, you know, the American president DNA and then also just kind of what place did it have when it first launched in the larger sort of TV context and the larger context of political media? What, you know, what's going on in the fall of 99? Yeah. So this show was produced by John Wells, who was the, you know, hit maker who had created ER and basically at, at this point could kind of do whatever he wanted um, on TV. He was going to make this show with Warner Brothers. I think he had a deal. And he met with Aaron Sorkin one day to ask him, you know, what TV show might he want to create? Um, And this was after The American President had come out. And the pitch was basically to make that movie, um, but without sort of the romantic comedy uh, sort of elements, just about the senior staffers, in in the White House. It would be basically a workplace drama, mm-hmm. dramedy, and it was supposed to be more focused on on the staff, the senior staff, than, than the president. Um, it got greenlit after Sorkin wrote the pilot, but then it was shelved for a bit because of the Monica Lewinsky, mm. Bill Clinton hmm. scandal. Everyone was so fatigued listening to the you know, day to day of that affair that I think maybe rightly they said, Mm. let's just wait, let's not put out a TV show about what happens inside the West wing. (laughs) Um, So even though it was, it was basically greenlit in 1998 um, while that was going on, uh, they, they shelved it and it didn't come out for, for another year. It's such an interesting moment then that it does come out um, because it's still during the Clinton administration. But as folks who are familiar with the West Wing will know, it has this much 
more optimistic view of politics. Um, And for liberals in particular, coming at the tail end of the Clinton administration and then at the beginning of the Bush administration, the West Wing becomes this kind of form of political escapism, Mm -hmm. right? You can can immerse yourself in this world where, yes, the characters are flawed. In the very first episode, you find out that one of the staffers um, has slept with a prostitute. And so you already have this kind of like kind of salacious sex worker scandal happening um, in the first episode. But it feels like it's, it's people who are driven by good intent in politics. And so for so many people who are watching The West Wing in these early years, it was just like, oh, this is what I want politics to be like. Yeah. You know, the three biggest political shows, arguably, that have come after The West Wing would be, you know, House mm-hmm. of Cards, Scandal, and mm-hmm. Veep. Um, all of them have a really bleak view yeah. of fictional politics and that everyone's actually really cynical or inept or both. Um, yeah. I think the, the the sort of the fantasy of the West Wing was that the people who work in government are smart mm. and care. Mm-hmm. Right. Were people watching that and attracted to that from the beginning is your sense? Um, and then and then also were the people on the show kind of aware of that and drawn to it in that way as well? I know that the people who were making the show were really, really excited about it. I mean, I think they were mostly excited just about the sort of level of writing from Aaron Sorkin, the level of dialogue. But someone like Martin Sheen, who played the president, he was and has been, you know, very progressively active voice in, in Hollywood for a long time. So I, I certainly think that probably appealed to him, too. I always think that Aaron Sorkin is a genius when it comes to dialogue, like the way that he allows characters to speak, the sort of fast paced nature in which they speak, the sort of like funny, either like zingers or one liners or ways that sort of like people are interacting with each other. It makes it um, such a high energy to watch his shows uh, that I think that. I don't know. He he becomes in a lot of ways the secret sauce to a lot of successful TV shows that have that same sort of fast paced dynamic. Right. Yeah. And Shonda Rhimes was uh, mm-hmm. very much influenced Absolutely, by the West yeah. Wing. Mm-hmm. I mean, that also plays into this idea that like these people are brilliant and they care and they're earnest and they can spit sentences that are just beautiful in this way. And it creates this sort of hyper, hyper mm-hmm. reality. Yeah. I mean, I also think that the the set itself and the fact that there were political people who were consultants on it. I I think it also made it feel so much more real. Like it gave a realness to the escapism because you also felt like you were in some ways like learning something about what the West Wing looked like and what these positions were and how, not how a bill became a law because we covered that uh, in an earlier um, iteration of television, but like how how politics worked behind the scenes. Um, It really did feel like in an era before... We were so like when everybody knew who the chief of staff was and everybody knows who like all of these um, interior people at the West Wing are when it it was kind of more of a niche obsession. um, Suddenly you have this behind the scenes look that for people like me who were super interested in politics, it just it felt it didn't feel educational or didactic Mm -hmm. in that way. But it did feel like you were getting to see something that had been kind of secret knowledge Mm -hmm. before. I've interviewed Aaron Sorkin you know, several times over the course of making the West Wing Weekly podcast. And when I've asked him about sort of the political aspirations or, you know, the didactic aspirations or anything like that, he always, always says that his number one goal and really his only goal was to make something that was entertaining to watch. Mm. Um, And I think that it's interesting that that was kind of his aim. But then, yeah, his writing staff was filled with these people and you know and the consulting staff had all these people from um the real world of politics because they would give him things that might on the surface seem like dry topics for for tv like we're going to do an episode about the census (laughs) but then you have uh this playwright who's trying to metabolize that into something really engaging and entertaining and uh and i think that's how it works i think that's Mm -hmm. how we end up with what the west wing was a show that taught us something, something that we might not otherwise uh, want to take in because it feels Mm. like homework and presented in a way that felt like it was just Mm. fun to watch. And this is the big thorny question at the heart of the West Wing and its legacy, you know, but but how do you think about the kind of way in which it set out a model for politics, um, either 
told people this is what politics is really like or said this is what politics should be like and you know you should get into politics because it can be this way i mean you know what is the disconnect between the the reality of politics in the west wing and the reality of politics in the real world well i think that there are so many obama era staffers Mm -hmm. who were just the right age uh, when Mm -hmm. this show was on that it really drove them to enter the world of politics because they thought this could be a reality. And there are a lot of folks who we spoke to for the podcast who were Obama staffers um, who specifically cited, oh, yeah, it was the West Wing that got me into, um, got me on this path. Yeah, that vision that you could do good within government and coming off the heels of the 1980s and 1990s, um, decades in which the idea that government wasn't a good thing was very popular and you had um, all of the scandals surrounding the Clinton presidency. This sort of rebirthed uh, the idea that of good government, yeah. right? Like that that you go and you do public service and maybe you don't like change the world every day, but you can change it, it enough. And yes, you, you absolutely hear all of these Obama staffers um, talking about it while they're in the West Wing. Um, they do a West Wing <laughs> weekly and they, uh, they bring back a big block of cheese day, which was something that was back from the Andrew Jackson administration, but the West Wing sort of rediscovers it thanks to their political consultants and then the Obama administration brings it back. Um, So there's a lot of like, there's a feedback. Can you trace that again? That that is so twisted. (laughs) Of real politics to TV politics to real politics again, but refracted through. That's crazy. I I mean, Krisha, you probably know the details of this as well. But um, so one of the political consultants to the show had said that Andrew Jackson had this moment um, where he would have the big block of cheese day where people were welcome to come into um, the White House and share their ideas. And they were like, oh, this would make a really cool episode. It is, in fact, a very good episode. Um, And then the Obama administration holds a a digital big block of cheese day where people can come in and bring their ideas to the White House. Um, So it's a way of kind of opening the door between the people and the president. You're used to hearing my voice on the world, bringing you interviews from around the globe. And you hear me reporting environment and climate news. I'm Carolyn Beeler. And I'm Marco Werman. We're now with you hosting the world together. More global journalism with a fresh new sound. Listen to the world on your local public radio station and wherever you find your podcasts. So, you know, I do want to keep kind of probing on this question of whether the West Wing set a model that was like useful for the politics that we live with, you know, because I do think, especially in the last 10 years or so, you know, we've gotten a real glimpse of the fact that politics is much more cynical Mm. and much more divisive. I mean, you know, I'll tell you that in my kind of like most irked moments, I kind of feel like, oh, gosh, for a while when I watched this show, I, you know, I got West Wing brained for a while and I got deluded (laughs) and I got deluded in a sense about politics and frankly about kind of um, the good intentions by all sides Mm -hmm. of politics. And Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of folks, when then we got into the last 10 Mm -hmm. years of politics, we realized, man, it really is not that way. And maybe we were asleep at the wheel Mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, And I wonder, Rishi, I'm sure you've heard this criticism before and thought about this and talked about it. But I wonder what you what you make of that idea that the West Wing kind of diluted people a little bit. I think that uh, that's kind of on you, Jody, honestly. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm because, to be clear, it is on me. Yeah. <laughs> because what I found watching the show is that for all of their good intentions, the Bartlett administration accomplishes very little. Huh. Um, they have these high-minded policy ideas, and then they get watered down, sometimes by the administration uh, itself, before it even gets put into practice or, or, or goes in front of uh, any legislative bodies because they're so worried about whether or not they might be able to make it work or or not. And I think what I love about the show is how much political compromise you see them have to make. Despite their principles, they're constantly getting sort of worn down either internally or externally. And and then when they have these big fights, I mean, they're losing all the time. And and at the end of the show, um, you know, the president has a lot of these kinds of existential 
moments where he's reflecting on his legacy. And frankly, yeah, it's not a it's not a great mm-hmm. track record. They didn't pass like incredible landmark legislation. They mm-hmm. didn't do maybe anything or certainly maybe not enough to change the political discourse even within the boundaries of of this fictional world that they that you know Aaron Sorkin has control over. So I I don't think that that it's the show's fault if you were to watch right. it and be like, "Hey, uh if you are a hardcore liberal democrat and you're smart and you go in there, all these great things mm-hmm. are going to happen." No, that's not what happens in the show. And I actually I think that the fact that so many Obama staffers were influenced by the West Wing and came into office in this moment of very high optimism and the experience of watching the show fueled their passion for politics. I think that colors our memory, mm. um, which is why having a rewatch right. is such a good idea. But I think it colors our memory of what the West Wing was, especially as politics got worse yeah. and worse. Um, it, it was easier to point at the West Wing and blame it for that. But yeah, I mean, if you, if you, I had recently been revisiting um, sort of the arc of the show and it's, it's a little dark actually. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose it's worth remembering, you know, throughout the two thousands with Bush as president and the Iraq war ramping up, you know, liberals did not, I don't think real, any liberal with their eyes open was deluding themselves about the nature of politics and the cynicism of politics. And so the West Wing was, you know, was refuge, but only refuge in the sense that liberals were very aware of the reality. Um, all I wonder, um, can you can you remake a show like this? Is it possible, like in the world hmm. that we live in now, where you get like seven episodes a season, <laughs> where, where you're not getting these long sort of... Um, arcs and in the same way that you were when you were getting I don't know 20 25 episodes a season or when you have a show that's optimistic and political like is it possible (laughs) to make a show like this today is there is there HBO remake or something is there something that would be possible given our landscape I don't know it's you know one of the things I think that's the biggest I don't know if you want to call it a problem or whatever. Um, the most fantastical part of the West Wing is not even just like, oh, uh, what's happening within the administration. There are a lot of moments in the show where you see real bipartisan conversations mm-hmm. happening. Um, yeah. You f- see this kind of cooperation or common ground. L- like, I think the thing that's the hardest about the show is it's kind of really more than a liberal fantasy. I think it's a centrist fantasy. Mm. Yes. yes. And that there is this idea that there's a wide middle that includes a lot of sort of principally minded Democrats and Republicans and independents who all kind of believe in a kind of vaguely socially forward, fiscally kind of conservative, kind of capitalistic (laughs) kind of uh, view of what government can achieve. And you'll often see like these conversations where Someone from the left crosses over to the right. Someone from the right crosses over to the left and they find this common ground and they and real friendships exist. And I think that's the hardest Mm -hmm. thing to imagine. That's the thing where it's like, well, now, as we know, like the bell curve has kind of Mm -hmm. flipped instead of being a wide middle, a big center where in the inverse of that, where the far left and the far right are certainly the most vocal. I think that's the thing that's hardest to imagine. It's like, how could you make a TV show? where the center is, you know, like who wants to watch a show about Who's yeah. That for? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a, sh- it's a it's show. Joe Manchin. Walking yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Joe Manchin actually is Manchin. I think is in some ways like the epitome of the opposite of the West Wing, right? He's, right. he's a person who belongs to one party and is going to stymie everything and like get nothing done and also still be vilified by the other <laughs> yeah. side. That exactly. he's, yeah. I think there's like a, maybe like a, John Kerry, Mitt Romney, mm-hmm. uh, oh, Mitt Romney hybrid person. Do so you know, well you well smash well. the two of them together, and that's you can cast this show quite easily now because all of those people are retiring yeah. from politics, <laughs> and so they have they have time. You know, yeah. But that's that's all. That those are the people who would be the stars, and as we know, those are not the stars of political no. discourse. No, right. I do think that this more than the optimism is where yeah. the West Wing comes in for criticism these days for its influence on politics, that it brought in this generation of Obama staffers who thought that the other side was rational and that they could work with them and find this bipartisan compromise and wasn't bipartisan compromise the the highest value in politics. Um, I do think, Kelly, to answer your question, Parks and Recreation is that show. 
mm. right? That has this yes. like mm-hmm. warm hearted belief in that government can do good. You have Ron Swanson, who's a libertarian kind of right wing guy, and Leslie Nope, who is more of a um, uh, not quite as a, more of a liberal, um, but they're able to come together be- out of a shared sense of purpose, but also a shared sense of respect for one another. And it's telling that that is a story that is playing out in mm. local politics and not in the White House in that <laughs> moment. Yeah. One of my favorite bonus episodes that we did was the crossover with Parks and Recreation. We did a West Wing focused um, episode ju- just about the making of Parks and Recreation with the creator, Michael Shore, and with Adam Scott. And uh, they talked about how much the West Wing was part of the initial Mm. DNA of that show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Well, if you ever want to go back and do a show about... Well, Big Brother is still on. That was opposite of West Wing. If you're ever looking for a very short rewatch podcast, you could do Get Real, which aired on Fox for, let me count here, six months between <laughs> September and April. But that was what Fox was putting up against uh, the West Wing. So, yeah, I think the West Wing kind of wins mm-hmm. out um, looking at this Wednesday I feel like night Grow Up needs a, a rewatch podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever that ABC show that was. That lasted a week. Um, no thanks. But I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but actually, we should, was was it? A, we should have asked. Like, was it a hit from the beginning, as far as you could tell, or did it have this? Like, a lot of those shows had that like DVD uh, afterlife that I think really pushed them into the consciousness. But uh, no, it was a yeah. it was definitely a hit. I mean, there were certainly fewer shows <laughs> to be up against, right. <laughs> but um, it had by today's standards staggering audiences, yeah. um, especially by the end of the first season, and certainly in, in, in the second season. But it also won a bunch of Emmys. Um, after the first season, it was it was a hit commercially mm. right away. Yeah, and then you were telling me um, when we were chatting recently about Aaron Sorkin, he wrote every single word on The West Wing, um, but also wrote pretty much yeah every single word on what was it another Sports show? Night on Sports Night, which was happening yeah. at the same time. That's exactly yeah, in September of 1999, when The West Wing uh, was coming out for its first season, Sports Night uh, was coming out for its second season, also written by. Aaron Sorkin and also directed by Tommy Shlami. They were the executive producers of, of that show. And so they would flip from one, from one, uh, 30 minute comedy to this hour long drama, uh, every week, 22 episodes for both. It's and wild. if you're asking yourself how someone can pull that off, the answer is you can drugs <laughs> <laughs> and genius drugs and genius. <laughs> um, all right, let's leave it there. Rishi Kashir, right. Thank you so much. And folks can go, Binge the West Wing, binge the West Wing Weekly. There's people who listen to the podcast and don't actually watch the show, right? There's people who've, there's a guy have to have been people. I think the only people who do that are people who have watched the West Wing so many times that right. they don't right. need to watch the episode to listen to the yeah. uh, podcast because they, they're like, yeah, yeah, I, I remember. Of course, I can picture mm-hmm. every scene. Right, right, yeah. Every single beat, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. But like all good podcasts, you built your own world and it was really you know just a joy to listen to on its own. Mm-hmm. But anyway, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's been a while since we've done the podcast. We ended yeah. in 2020. So it's nice to get to talk about the show. I know. Also, because of the writer's strike mm-hmm. and the actor's strike, mm-hmm. um, we can't really do anything around it because my co-host, Josh, of course, was a uh, sag after member. Mm-hmm. And because we want to honor the um, the efforts that the unions are, are totally. working towards to try and get the people who are responsible for shows like The West Wing mm-hmm. properly compensated. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is an all-in-one management software with apps for every business need. Odoo has apps for CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, manufacturing, and everything in between. And they're all in one easy-to-use software. And the best part about Odoo? All Odoo apps are integrated, helping you get things done faster and more efficiently. So, when you think about business, think Odoo. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash this day. 
Radiotopia. Radiotopia.